interesting. To have a conversation about this, we're joined with Jose Luis Granados Seja. Um, he is a writer and photojournalist based in Mexico City. Jose, welcome to the show. How are you doing this morning? Good morning. I'm doing great. It's good to be here. Excellent. So what was your take? I'm just getting your take on the Summit of Americas itself. I mean, it seemed that the Biden administration wanted to show strength um, and doing so showing Americans still have leadership and they can pull together all of these other countries and do so forth. But the problem is at the point where it disowns the other countries, then you get multiple other countries that basically don't want to be ostracized. And I strongly suspect that many of those countries, especially left wing governments, know that they can be also held at the boot of the U.S. every bit as much as Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela. Meaning, all of those countries, A, have had some, from the standpoint of coups, take place where, let's say, dictor, uh, dictators were basically installed. Or, for that part, all of those countries know that at any point, they could also find themselves ostracized, just like Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, and Venezuela. What is your take on this, though? How did you view the Summit of Americas and even the press um, surrounding the Summit of Americas, did it accomplish the objectives that Biden set forth? And if so, why or why not? I think if the objective was to once again project U.S. influence and power of the region, it's hard to say that this this summit was a success at all. In fact, I, I would argue that this summit was a total failure. And as you said, it was an unforced error. It was something that the White House brought upon itself. They totally botched this file. And the funny thing is, the Summit of the Americas was originally hosted in the United States for the first time in 1994. Right. And this was meant to be the showcase of the return of, of U.S. prominence in the region, especially after the last summit where Donald Trump was president, he chose not to attend. And so in a way to try to save face, the policymakers in Washington decided that they would host the summit, that this would be this premier event for the hemisphere, but they totally botched it. They, they, they really dropped the ball on this one beside, precisely because of what you said. I think they underestimated how much the region was willing to push back and presidents like Lopez Obrador, Lucho Arce, others who said, this is not a summit of the Americas if not everybody is invited. And it dominated all of the proceedings before and during. I think there was this expectation in the White House that once the summit got going, that people wouldn't be paying attention to who or who did not attend. But I think it was clear if anybody who watched even just a clip of the of the coverage, what we saw was every leader who did attend and their representatives, in, in the case of Mexico, for example, the foreign minister, Marcelo Obrad, went in place of Lopez Obrador. And we should be clear, Lopez Obrador did skip personally attending as a means of protest to send that message. And Marcelo Obrador said it was a mistake. Same Alberto Fernandez, president of Argentina, who originally was thinking about not going and joining in on the boycott, also said it was a mistake. And that was that was basically what everybody talked to before and during the summit, kind of ruining the party for the USians. And the thing is, is that what was the big takeaway from this? You know, usually there's some kind of large statement, there's a kind of a commitment. What we basically saw was the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration, which wasn't even signed by all the countries, it was only 20 countries. And what were the key countries missing from that discussion? Well, it was Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. These are all the countries where we see the most migration. The, uh, you know, for a number of years ago, it was mostly Central Americans. Before that, it was mostly Mexicans. Now what we're mostly seeing is Venezuelans coming through. Um, but how are you going to sign a migration pact if the key countries involved aren't there? Right. So even on that one, even the, the takeaway declaration from the summit was really a flash in the pan. Well, there wasn't much there. And I think there really needs to be some analysis on the part of the White House what went wrong. But here in Latin America, why do we pay attention to this summit? You know, there's this talk about maybe it losing its prominence. I'm of the opinion that it should. You know, we don't need the OAS, which is the technical secretariat that organizes these summits. You know, there are other regional bodies like the Community of Latin American and Caribbean states that holds its own summit, which includes all of the countries that doesn't exclude anybody for political reasons, yeah, right. but it does exclude the U.S. and Canada because of the economic dominance they do have in the hemisphere. We don't need that. We don't need the summit of the Americans anymore. You know, it's funny, the OAS. And, and by the way, Belize president also, when he got there, he basically gave a tongue wagging to Biden to his face, which is what, kind of my point, right? It's like you're trying to project strength and you're trying to show that you're leadership and everything else. And yet many countries don't show up and other countries that do show up, several countries basically give you a tongue wag in front of the audience. Oh, tongue lashing. Tongue lashing. Oh, it is a tongue wag. Yeah. yeah. I was like, 
He liked, he was panting at him. No, <laughs> all right, gave a tongue lashing. He was tongue lashing. I mean, he basically made the point of saying, like, look, you should have invited Venezuela. He made the point of saying Cuba had gave us doctors, basically, to help with the COVID issue. And even went so far True. as to say that it is un-American um, for you to basically have this illegal blockade against Cuba. I mean, he went far into that. The OAS, I want to hit that for a moment. So I was sitting in on a panel with the OAS, and they were basically, one of the women were talking about basically bringing in the indigenous community into governments. That was her discussion. And she basically was making a point of saying, you know, the indigenous community gets, um, uh, let's say, attacked, or they get, um, they, they get talked about. Um, they are suffering signs of, what is the word I'm looking for? Is that racism? But may, may, let's just call it racism for the time being. And basically that in, unless they're integrated into the government, same thing with women, same thing with people of color, that those governments cannot be democracies. Okay, fair enough. Then she goes and says that the OAS has been a great tool for election integrity. And like oh. I said, I nearly fell out my chair. <laughs> well, we, should, we should also note that it, at least when I worked at RT, uh -huh. we, we, our cameras caught him, caught Elliot Abrams going to the OAS to meet with them. Really? And Elliot Abrams, as we know, is instrumental to what was happening under the Reagan administration in Nicaragua. Yes. Oh, that's fascinating. Because, you know, if I'm not mistaken, that's the guy that Trump brought back, right? Yes, he brought yes, him back. Trump brought him back. The guy who was a criminal Trump brought the guy back who had to get across basically what he was trying to do to Venezuela. But the OAS, when, he, when he, she said that, I stood up. When I got the opportunity to ask the question and I said, look, guys, I agree with your original premise about the women and everything else being a part of government. Fair enough. I said I was shocked by the comment you guys made with the OAS, especially you. And I'm pointing to the woman who was an indigenous woman. I said Evo Morales was instrumental in getting the indigenous community into the government, meaning one of the key um, attributes that he had was basically bringing the indigenous community into politics. I said the OAS was instrumental and kicking off the process that deposed him in a violent coup. I said, so the idea that you're basically talking about these guys as election integrity um, proponents is shocking to me. It's yeah, they looked at hilarious. me like I had lost my mind. They're like, uh, 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 he brought that up? Yes, I brought that up because I was shocked that you guys said that. What is your take on the OAS? Because at the People's Summit, this was the protest against the um, America's Summit, or Summit for America's. They kind of made that point, too, that the OAS is a problem, that the OAS needs to be disbanded, et cetera. Explain why and give me your rationale for that. Well, here in Latin America, do you know what we call the OAS? We call it the U.S. Ministry of Colonies. Mm -hmm. It's an institution that was designed to facilitate the displacement, the marginalization, the exploitation of the countries of Latin America. And it responds to the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine in the United States, which claims, you know, America for los, para los Americanos, right? That, that everything in the Western Hemisphere is within the sphere of influence of the United States, and they will interfere when they think necessary. And that's what the OAS has done historically, is respond to that policy imperative. And now you'll hear statements from, I remember Obama at a previous summit of the America said the, the Monroe Doctrine was in the past, and then Trump came and he said it's back. And now you have <laughs> Biden talking about how the Latin America, it's not the backyard of the United States, it's the front yard, as if that's a better <laughs> idea. But anyway, the OAS has always played oh that role. God. It has been designed to try to facilitate the, the, the displacement and the exploitation of territories in, the, in Latin America. It's funny that, you know, in these recent summits, we talk about the, the so-called democracy deficit, that's just the language that the State Department likes to use. Where was this language when dictatorships, U.S.-backed dictatorships, were ruling all across the region? Why is it that Cuba is the only one that's been historically excluded? Because it's a policy decision, it's a political decision. And, it's, and that's why this organization that historically has facilitated this is not reformable. I actually made this point, you know, in the United States, there's a lot of talk about uh, what to do with the situation with police, right? And there's a call to abolish the police because it's an institution that's fundamentally at odds with working class interests, okay? Well, if that's the, the criteria, and I agree with it, then the OAS is an institution that is fundamentally at odds with the interests of the working class in Latin America and therefore should be abolished. And it's as simple as that. And, and as you said, right, I think the, the irony of saying that, that we need to incorporate more rights for more people, that's the language of the current Secretary General of the OAS, Luis Almagro, 
But at the same time, the countries that are actually following through on that, actually expanding rights, you know, Bolivia is, a, is actually constitutionally a plurinational state. Right. It's a recognition that it is a country made up of many nations, including indigenous people. It's actually the only country in the hemisphere that, that has that sort of model and consideration to other indigenous peoples like in Guatemala, uh, in Canada even. And yet that's the country that was the victim of a OAS-led coup, as you've correctly identified. So if that's the role that this organization is going to play, if they're going to put on this charade every two to three years, calling it the Summit of the Americas, but excluding people, then we don't have a need for it. We can organize amongst ourselves. We're, we're plenty old enough, plenty big enough, plenty mature enough, politically speaking, to be able to handle our own affairs here in Latin America and the Caribbean without the interference of the of, of the US via the OAS. It's interesting, you, you mentioned the, the Caribbean leaders. They were talking about boycotting, but then shortly afterwards, and I don't know if you caught this, they were talking about intense diplomatic pressure. Whenever you hear people talking about being on the receiving end of intense diplomatic pressure from the U.S., we're talking about arm twisting. Right. We're talking about <laughs> threats. Right. right. And that's why many of them ultimately showed up, because they're like, if you don't show up, we're going to cut off this this or that right. aid program yes. that you desperately need. You know, it's it's blackmail. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they, you don't want to throw a party, Jose, and invite all these people and then no one shows yeah. up. That like, cause then it's like, it's egg on your face, right? But as we brought up, um, you know, I brought up Elliot Abrams and, and his role, you know, back in the 80s in, in Nicaragua. But today, well, not today, this weekend, modern times now, the Nicarag Nicaraguan president, Daniel Ortega, has just authorized Russian troops and planes and ships to deploy into the country um, for training, law enforcement, practice of, you know, emergency response, um, Maria, Maria Zakrova, the spokeswoman um, in, in Russia for the Federation, says this is nothing out of the ordinary. Calm down. This is just routine. But as you noted, Nicaragua was not invited to the summit. Does this, does their relationship with Russia have anything to do with the not getting invited to the, the hot girl party? I think the U.S. is trying to put into practice a new strategy. I think what they're trying to do is divide the world into two camps. And basically, and it's not a new, particularly new strategy, but it's just the latest in, in a long series one of, of, of different excuses. And this latest one basically says there are countries that are democracies and there are countries that are autocracies. And if you want to be with the good guys and if you want to be on our side, well, then you have to be a democracy. But it's, you know, it's it's Washington's definition of democracy. So basically, if you have something like the U.S. has, which has, you know, you know there's a saying that we say in, in typical American exceptionalism, the U.S. has two ruling parties, but they just trade places back and forth. And, you know, that's not necessarily the only rubric we should be using for determining what is democracy, right? So they don't like that Daniel Ortega keeps getting reelected. They don't like that Nicolas Maduro consistently wins election uh, in, in spite of the U.S. hybrid war on Venezuela. And so they label them autocracies and they try to lump them together with all of the bad actors on the global scene. And, you know, right, like with just also playing into this whole media narrative about what are the good countries, what are the bad countries, right? Like we see all this talk about uh, you know, China wanting now to invade Taiwan. And now it's like, it's just this constant drumming on to try to, one, create those two camps and pre provide the pretext when it becomes necessary to intervene directly in the affairs of other countries. And, and also to, to try to marginalize on the, on the global seat. You know, uh, the, the concern that the U.S. has is that it is losing influence in the region, right? And it's not just China, which is a, a very key, key trade partner. It's only Mexico remains the, the, the number one trading partner with, with the United States. All the rest of the countries of Latin America now trade more significantly in a larger amounts with China. Uh, but also Russia, right? You know, yeah. one of the reasons we saw the high-level delegation that visited Venezuela, despite the U.S. insisting that it does not recognize Maduro as the president, it was because they were there are people who are afraid about the relationships. But we're sovereign countries. Right. You know, if Nicaragua wants to invite through its own domestic political agenda these kinds of uh, exchanges with with Russia, then they have the right to do so. They're sovereign nations. And Venezuela similarly was, you know, we just had Maduro do a tour of Asia and he right. signed a 20 year agreement with Iran. Iran is also one of those enemies of the United States. Mm -hmm. Then they have the sovereign right to do so. Uh, and I think that at the very least, one of the key things that we can depend on is that we as a region defend that principle. Yeah, isn't it funny that for the last couple of years, 
it was the U.S. and, and like 50 other countries saying uh, Juan Guaido is the official leader <laughs> of Venezuela. But yet, you know, when gas started hitting $4 a gallon, the U.S. sends a delegation down to Venezuela to talk with Nicolas Maduro. And suddenly he's the president. <laughs> Not Juan Guaido, who this weekend was getting chairs thrown at him. I, I like to say they were pulling chairs out for him because we're in polite society. <laughs> they were pulling chairs out. We're, we're pulling chairs out for, <laughs> for, for, it for out. I don't know, the, the non-official president, Juan Guaido. But, I mean, doesn't the U.S. realize how silly this looks? Is that you've been trying to prop up this guy, this Juan Guaido guy, and then suddenly when the stuff hits the fan... You go down to Venezuela, and guess what? You're talking to Nicolas Maduro. You're not talking to Juan Guaido. Oh, they didn't go to the President Guaido for gas? No! <gasps> so how does that even what? make sense? Absolutely. And, and I, Juan Guaido probably wishes he had gotten that invite to the Summit of the Americas. As you said, he had a really bad weekend. <laughs> we even had some State Department officials tweeting about attacks on Juan Guaido. Here's the thing, though. You know, this wasn't the government and it wasn't government supporters. It wasn't colectivos. It's ordinary Venezuelans yeah. who hate the guy's guts. <laughs> He's a nobody. Nobody knew who he was when he announced that he was going to declare himself president. Nobody knows who he's now. I don't know if you caught this, but even the new U.S. press secretary couldn't even pronounce his last name. Oh. This guy's legitimacy entirely depends on the U.S., and they can't even get his name right. He's nobody, right? But what he is doing is making it even more difficult for the country to be able to climb out of this crisis that it finds itself. And so that sort of frustration, it's not just government supporters. It's ordinary Venezuelans, maybe people who probably sympathize with the opposition saying, this guy's a clown, we don't want him here. And, you know, that's probably also why he didn't get, despite being the pres the interim president as recognized by the U.S. and a handful of countries, because it's less and less every day. It's about 16 these days uh, as the as the president of Venezuela. Uh, instead, he's getting his shirt ripped off. I, know. Some I would love Guaido club. to come out and be like, we're going to give U.S. oil. Yeah, but like, exactly. <laughs> why Why did the U.S. send a delegation, you know, like three weeks ago? Yeah. Why not send it to Guaido? Well, how come they didn't go talk to Guaido if, he's, yeah. if we're going to recognize him as the president? So why are they going to talk to Maduro? Maduro's people. You know, one of the other things at the conference was China. Even though they didn't bring it up, it was there. And it was hiding behind the scenes in some of the commentary that was taking place. I think it was Gutierrez. He made a comment, and I remember writing down, oh, he's talking about China. Well, they were basically saying economic investment into the region in order to stop, I think they call it like malign actors or authoritarian governments from getting a hold into the country itself, which, of course, they're talking about China in this case. Um, the relationship with China and South America, how deep in detail, how in-depth is that? I know Bolivia was one of the countries that China was working with for lithium reserves, but how does it go for the other countries? Ooh, spe speaking of that, Jose, I did, I did my own report on my, my own little independent YouTube channel about the lithium in Mexico mm. and how AMLO um, nationalized it. And there are major, major contracts for the lithium with Chinese companies. I remember that. That was a and few I mentioned weeks it ago. here. Yeah, like maybe a month ago. Yeah, I mentioned recent. it here on this show. Yeah, because I I posted up on my my own YouTube. But I was like I was like, gosh, we should. You know, I thought about you yeah. because you're you're in Mexico. There are major contracts with Mexico from um, Chinese state de uh, developers and and you know the companies that are doing the the mining for the lithium. Yeah. What happens to them because AMLO has has nationalized it and it's going through lightning speed it has 90 days i believe for um the 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 lower house to pass laws around that or rules around that what's happening with that and what's that going to do to the relationship between mexico and china yeah and expand that into the other south american nations also with china yeah, for sure. So the the relationship with China and and South America, and in particular, is has been growing. It's a, it's a really key trade partner for South for South America these days. And what we saw was basically it coincided the sort of the boom of the the so called pink tide in Latin America coincided with this this huge increase in demands of commodities of primary goods. And so that relationship really really grew, especially in the in basically the start of this century. Uh, and I was just looking this up here according to. to Reuters, excluding Mexico, total trade flows, imports and exports between Latin America and China hit 247 billion last year, which is far more 
than the 174 billion with the United States. So you can, this is what I was referring to earlier. The relationship is, is really key. Mexico is different. Mexico has that shared border. It's the, the busiest um, trade corridor that in, in, in the hemisphere. And so the relationship with Mexico and the United States, especially also with NAFTA and then the new NAFTA is deeply intertwined. So there's less of, of an opportunity, but there still is one. And I think the lithium one is, is a good one to look at. Uh, it's true that here in Mexico, Lopez Obrador is pursuing a nationalist economic agenda, right? So he's looking to rescue the state oil form. It's gotten uh, a lot of progress in that. It's actually returning money to the government. It was, they were deliberately trying to kill it off before the arrival of Lopez Obrador to the government, trying to find the excuse to privatize it. He's gone very far in terms of, of rescuing it. It's actually contributing to government coffers now, which wasn't the case previously. There's the rescue of the electricity company and this interest in exploiting lithium for the national interest. And so what in order to do that, you have to nationalize. It has to be under your control. And you're right. I think one of the first ones to look to sign contracts for the, ex the, the exploitation of lithium here in Mexico were Chinese firms. And so from what I've read, they're going to be basically grandfathered in. The thing is, is that Mexico has very little experience in actually extracting lithium. And it's a complicated process. In fact, Bolivia, which has the largest reserves in the world, one of the challenges that they found is that their lithium is a little bit harder to get to than the ones that you can find in Chile, if I'm not mistaken. And so there's going to be a lot of reliance on the expertise that's going to come from China, the, the the technological advancements that are coming from there. So I would expect that there would be some kind of cooperation. And I would hope that that would actually facilitate increased cooperation. I lived a number of years in Ecuador, and it was amazing to see the positive impact of, of Chinese cooperation in Ecuador, right? And so Ecuador is a very small country, doesn't count on a lot of um, capital flows. And so they were able to, through the, the relationships with the Chinese, they actually signed these contracts to kind of like pre-sell oil to them in order to finance their project. They built one of the largest hydroelectric dam in Ecuador, which provides almost half of the country's energy needs. And so these kinds of relationships are really important, especially for these countries that we should be clear, right? Like they, if they're underdeveloped, quote unquote, it's because of a legacy of imperialism, which subjugated them into this position of only exporting primary goods, of not being able to advance in, in, in the, the, the means of production in the country. And so that's why this relationship with, with China, with just expertise, and it's also a very different relationship. You know, there's this saying here that when China comes to the global south, we get infrastructure. When the U.S. comes, we get a lecture. And so that relationship is far healthier. And I think there's a, there's a lot more interest. And I would hope that Mexico, despite its proximity to the U.S., is also part of that and part of an old, overall process where there's more of, of a, a turn towards the South, right? Why is it that there isn't more economic activity with the rest of Latin America? Why is it always kind of oriented towards the North? And what can we do to change that? Hmm. Very interesting. I, I'm curious, from the standpoint of immigration, there was something that Biden said in his speech where he was basically making a point of saying, we will defend our borders, but, and it sounded like he was talking about some kind of new architecture in regards to immigration. Now, with the arrangement that the United States has with Mexico, where basically asylum seekers have spent time in Mexico instead of coming into the United States, what do, what do you think he's meaning by that? I mean, do you think, I mean, from the standpoint of Mexico, how, I'll just, let me ask it that way. What do you think he means by that? Because I got to be honest, I was unclear on what kind of new architecture he was talking about from the standpoint of immigration. But I do know with the number of immigrations or immigrants that are coming to the United States, the numbers have swelled over the course of the last several years. And so it sounds like they are trying to come up or Biden is trying to come up with some plan in order to basically stem the tide of the people coming to the U.S. Because he kept saying orderly immigration, et cetera, but it was unclarity on that point. Any ideas? Oh, I think I think what you're what you're saying is it is it is a bit of a a, um, a contradiction, because if we remember the campaign, right? What was one of the major issues that the Democrats tried to use to try to craft the narrative in terms of like what is what makes us different from the Republicans, right? And the migration was one of them. You know, this commitment to a humanitarian approach, no more kids in cages. It's interesting how this whole kids in cages, which are still a it's just still a reality, are no longer talked about by, by US liberals, right? And it was basically a, an attempt to try to create a wedge issue in their favor to say that, no, we're gonna be different. But at the end of the day, 
now that Biden's been in power, you know, there's a lot of noise at the beginning of the term. He, he promised to invest in uh, this new, in, in, in easier means of, of migration. There was going to be a moratorium on deportations. Uh, he said they was going to present a bill in Congress for a radical overhaul of the U.S. migration system. But now that he's been in power, what has been done is basically it's a lot of the same. You know, and it's precisely what you're identifying. It, it isn't a recognition of the United States as a country and its obligations to the rest of the world, its obligations under international law to asylum seekers, its obligations to migrants and refugees. No, it's all driven by this idea that they need to dissuade people from coming at all. And so that's what you see in this accord, this idea that it's basically to try to get people to stop coming to the United States. And so there's this talk about uh, agreements as, you know, where Belize is going to give uh, temporary status to, to migrants or Mexico is going to offer thousands of jobs to Central Americans. And like, that's all good and well. That should happen. If there are migrants, uh, asylum seekers who want to relocate to other countries in the region in order to flee the situation that they find themselves in in their countries of origin, that's fine. Yeah. But that does not absolve the United States of its responsibilities, right? Yeah. And again, I have to go back to this point. Why are these countries, you know, we're talking about uh, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, why are they in the situation that they find themselves in? Why do they have so many uh, migrants fleeing their countries? Well, it's also because of US imperialism, because of this idea, this imposition from the United States to deny them uh, an independent economic path, right? We saw. Honduras was the number one source country in Central America of migrants. Honduras was ruled by a dictatorship backed by the U.S. for 12 years that was imposed after U.S.-backed coup, right? And so if there isn't a recognition on the part of the United States that actually all many of these people are fleeing precisely because of U.S. actions in their countries of origin, therefore they have a responsibility to take them in. But it seems like they're trying to wash their hands of it, and that's really dangerous. As, as you, like I said, you know, we had the Remain in Mexico started with Trump, you know, this idea that, that migrants are forced to stay on this side of the border, mm -hmm. but it was continued under Biden. And there was this promise, and there's all these court cases, but why, where's the progress? You know, in fact, when the courts ordered Biden to reinstate Remain in Mexico, DHS actually expanded it to include people who weren't originally included, including Haitians. So it just speaks to the fact that this, this, what they said on the campaign trail now in power doesn't seem to be actually translating into any difference in policy. Wow. Yeah, the Biden administration has punted on a lot of things that they criticize the the Trump administration for. So I think it's pretty evident, you know, the proof is in the pudding, as Jose has so eloquently pointed out.